Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon colloquium. Um, today, our speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Hao Zhen. He is a professor of electrical and computer engineering, and I believe as physics as well, uh, here at the University of Arizona. He joined uh, the university in 2005, and since he has uh, uh, become a full professor in 2013, he was named Arizona Engineering Fellow. He got his PhD in physics from MIT uh, in 2001, and then from 2000 to 2003, he was a principal scientist with the Rockwell Scientific Community. He also served as a, sen a senior principal um, multidisciplinary engineer with Raytheon Company from 2003 to 2005. His uh, primary uh, research interests are in the area of microwave, millimeter wave, and terahertz antenna devices. So a lot to share with optics, you know, the same underlying physics, and also in wireless communication and sensing systems. And his research interest uh, covered a broad range of high-frequency technologies, including applications of new materials and techniques in microwave to terahertz and circuits such as thermal acoustic imaging and electromagnetic band uh, crystals, so the kind of equivalent to photonic crystals in optics, and active metamaterials, carbon nanotubes, and so on. He has authored more than 230 refereed publications and has 14 patents. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Professor Hao Jin. He'll be talking uh, to us about investigation of thermoacoustic effect and its application. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, I will be uh, talking about the um, thermoacoustics and uh, uh, its related applications. So first, I will give a brief introduction of uh, thermoacoustic effect, and uh, uh, I will then talk about the motivation of uh, microwave-induced thermoacoustic imaging, and I will uh, provide some examples of applications, including breast cancer detection, standoff explosive detection, and uh, uh, a thermoacoustic communication before I conclude. So the uh, thermoacoustic effect is basically a generation of sound by absorbed uh, electromagnetic energy in a sample in an object. Um, and so basically, your incident electromagnetic wave intensity has to be modulated or uh, in the form of a pulse. And this EM wave could be anything, uh, could be microwave, could be optical, uh, optical laser. And in that case, uh, it's often called photoacoustic and an optoacoustic uh, um, uh, effects. And it can be lower frequency. For example, people are uh, trying to just use a few megahertz pulses as well. So the idea is you have an EM wave which is modulated and uh, so you can see there's the envelope changes, and when the envelope increases, you will have a temperature increase in your object you are trying to uh, either detect or interrogate, and the volume would expand, and when the uh, modulated uh, uh, amplitude, when the envelope falls, the temperature will fall, then the uh, volume will contract, Basically, you will have a vibration. And we know that whenever you have a physical vibration in a medium, uh, you produce sound. And uh, in our case, we're focusing on, on the ultrasound uh, frequency range. So the uh, thermoacoustic effect, just a little bit about the history. Uh, Professor Ross Wheaty, my collaborator, has given a quite a nice history uh, a few weeks ago. So I'll, I'll, we'll go quick uh, in here. So it's actually discovered in the 1880 by Alexander Bell. And the experiment he has done was he had a mirror and just uh, uh, reflects the incident sunlight to a solid sample, which uh, absorbs the optical uh, uh, signals. And then the modulation is, is done by a rotating slotted wheel, just like a bicycle wheel. And then it was discovered that uh, a human can hear the sound. So there's an induced sound. So that's the earliest the thermoacoustic uh, 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 signal, or uh, in this case, a photoacoustic, because it's the, the excitation is uh, our, our uh, light from the sound. So it's also in the 1950s. It's reported by by people working near radar. So people were constantly reporting they can hear the radar when radar was turned on. So in fact, they're not hearing the EM signal of radar, they're hearing the uh, thermoacoustic signal from the radar. And uh, coincidentally, 
It's interesting enough, it's also in the 1950s, microwave oven was discovered by, by radar engineers as well. Uh, there was, radar engineer had a chocolate bars in their pocket and then they worked near, near uh, high power radar. They found out the chocolate melted and then uh, there goes the microwave oven. So, so it's quite interesting history. And in fact, the first uh, pattern ever was uh, uh, on, on thermoacoustic imaging is actually by Professor Ted Bowen, who was, uh, uh, was a professor in the, in the physics department who passed away earlier this year. And that's in 1981. So now I switch gear a little bit to talk about uh, one of the major uh, motivations we're wor working in this area was breast cancer. So for breast cancer has the highest morbidity and second highest uh, mortality for women. And in the United States, uh, over 200,000 new cases are diagnosed every year. And it turns out that earlier diagnosis is crucial uh, to survive. So an earlier cancer detection is, uh, is uh, early breast cancer detection is, is extremely important. And that's why you probably heard on the news recently uh, there's, a, there's always constant uh, discussion and debate about uh, uh, how, uh, at what age or how often um, someone should uh, go through a X-ray mammography, which is the most widely used uh, uh, imaging modality for, for early breast cancer detection. Uh, it has lots of problems, and that's why there's so much debate. There's going back and forth. You should start from, uh, from 40 years old or 50 years old or do it every year or do it every other year. And the main, one of the main reasons are the x-ray, you know, of course, it's invasive and ionizing radiation. You get too much x-rays is never a good thing, and it may hurt your health uh, itself. But also, probably more importantly, there's a high false positive and uh, false negative rates, and there are actually lots of uh, unnecessary biopsies and even surgeries has been done, uh, which increase the, uh, the, the medical cost tremendously, and at the same time, it didn't really help the patients. And uh, also, the, uh, the, the process is the discomfort due to applied compression. And another commonly used technique is MRI. And, uh, um, you know, of course, on UA campus, there's a lot of MRI experts. MRI is, tends to be uh, costly, and the availability uh, has been also uh, an issue for example, you're going to need a large uh, DC magnet, or, or uh, which which um, makes the uh, availability of the of MRI um, not as widely used as uh, X-ray. And ultrasound is also uh, sometimes used as a complementary uh, technique. However, uh, ultrasound has a very low contrast, so between the um, malignant tumor you're trying to detect and the healthy tissue the contrast is, is not that great. So there comes a, another modality which is called a microwave imaging which came out uh, 20, 30 years ago. People have been working on this since the 1990s um, and it has higher contrast. So basically the tumor tend to have higher water content and water and the microwave frequency is very lossy and and therefore, your benign tissue and, and uh, uh, malignant tissue has a large conductivity slash dielectric constant uh, uh, contrast. However, microwave has a problem in terms of uh, low resolution. So uh, here's the optical science. So everybody knows the diffraction limit. You cannot do a, uh, you cannot get an image has a better resolution than about a half wavelengths. Uh, so microwave tends, usually the wavelengths you would use would be on the order of a centimeter. So you cannot really see anything uh, smaller than a centimeter uh, reliably. Another issue is uh, microwave imaging, you can think of it as radar. You send a microwave pulse, you measure the scattered back and signal, and then from the scattered signal, you compare with your, your transmitted signal you're trying to reconstruct the object property. But considering a biological tissue, there's a very high uh, electromagnetic heterogeneity. Basically, different components, different parts of a tissue has very different properties. So there are lots of scattering. So you have a two-way scattering problem going in and coming back. The reconstruction is, is very difficult. So that's why 
um, after even 20, 30 years of research, there hasn't been really any major uh, breakthrough in microwave imaging for breast cancer detection. So therefore, uh, here comes uh, microwave-induced thermoacoustic imaging. So the mechanism is repeated here. So you can see we have a pulsed microwave, goes to a sample, and there's going to be heat absorption. And then the sample would ex have a thermoelastic uh, expansion. Therefore, acoustic wave will be generated. <coughs> and then instead of a measure the scattered microwave, we would measure the scattered, uh, they generated the acoustic signal using acoustic sensors, and then we would reconstruct the image. And of course, uh, the uh, benefit you have, or the advantages are, we still have the high contrast because the signal source is coming from the, still the conductivity and dielectric uh, um, property difference. And then we have much higher resolution compared to traditional microwave imaging because now uh, we are doing ultrasound imaging. So ultrasound uh, wavelengths can be much smaller and uh, we have some control in, uh, in, in which kind of a frequency content we can generate. Then uh, we can easily go to millimeter or even sub-millimeter uh, resolution. And considering the uh, scattering problem, for a biological tissue, the acoustic heterogeneity is much less. It's uh, within 10%. And I have some slides later to show you that for the microwave uh, heterogeneity, you can have up to uh, 10,000 uh, 10, or 1,000% uh, and et cetera. So, so at least in one way on the returning pass, your, your scattering problem is much uh, better. And uh, there's a spectroscopy aspect. We have done uh, lots of study to uh, look at different microwave frequency and not only do imaging, but also do spectroscopy. If I have a time, I'll show some results um, later on the spectroscopy part. So the underlying principle is, so if we look at the breast tissue property and contrast, so plotted here are the, this is the dielectric constant or relative permittivity. And this here is the conductivity. Basically, it's the real and imaginary part of your permittivity. And the black line is the malignant tissue. The blue line is the normal uh, granular or muscle tissue, basically, in the breast. The red is adipose, or the, just the fat. So you can see that uh, in, in both the dielectric constant and the conductivity, the malignant tumor has a higher dielectric constant and a higher loss. And if we plot the percentage difference, and from here you can see it's very encouraging, compare fat and malignant tumor. There's a few hundred percent of a difference, contrast, or even up to uh, 1,600 uh, percent. If you look at the uh, malignant tissue and the glandular tissue, the difference is not that great anymore. It's kind of within 10 percent. So that, that's actually another potential issue, which uh, I will go back and uh, talk about that more. So uh, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, did I have the, uh, Example oh, here. I would like to show that actually in in late 1990s, early 2000, there's actually a, some clinical trial using thermoacoustic imaging for uh, breast cancer detection. Uh, there's uh, some very good uh, image has been produced, but overall the clinical trial uh, wasn't very successful in terms of uh, uh, cancer detection, and so. At that time, you know, there was there was a, a much less knowledge in why. Uh, this wasn't, you know, the, uh, the, the contrast was enough and et cetera. So what we started uh, uh, on this is we decided to build a uh, complete thermoacoustic imaging model, including both the microwave or electromagnetic part and the acoustic part so that we can have a, a good system understanding if we can detect anything or what's the reason uh, we cannot detect. We would like to be able to know that quantitatively. So this model involves a 3D electromagnetic modeling and 3D acoustic modeling. And with this model, another goal is to uh, establish a quantitative relationship between the input microwave power and its acoustic output. And in fact, if you look at uh, most of the thermoacoustic uh, experiments, uh, we would need to have a kilowatts of a peak power or higher, although the, uh, the uh, 
pulse width of the, of the microwave signal is very short. It's on the order of microseconds. So you don't really deposit lots of uh, energy in the tissue, but still uh, it would be, interest, it would be uh, important to do safety evaluation as well. So this model would help us in that regard too. And uh, <coughs> so, the, uh, so th this, with this model, we'll, we'll be able to evaluate a, a potential clinic thermoacoustic imaging system, and then we would understand the uh, interactions between different sections. For example, uh, if we change a different antenna, and if we use different uh, acoustic detector, uh, how, how can we optimize or improve the uh, system performance? So a typical model is shown here. So in this case, we have an excitation antenna drawn here, just a typical antenna, a uh, horn antenna. And we have an input microwave pulse, usually from uh, 1 to 3 gigahertz on that order. And uh, uh, it, it, in this case, it's a, uh, almost like a square pulse coming in. And this is radiated to the sample showing here. This is a breast phantom sample. The color map represents the conductivity. Uh, the, the red is high conductivity, blue is lower conductivity. And we also need coupling liquid because the, uh, the Ultrasound detector, for example, located here, uh, needs to have a liquid to couple because the ultrasound wave doesn't uh, go from uh, tissue to, to air. So you always need to have a coupling liquid, which we will talk more later because for some of the other applications like uh, explosive detection, you need to be stand off. So you don't have that luxury of a coupling liquid. So uh, if we look at the model, first of the EM model, which is simple, at least for us uh, who, who do uh, electromagnetics, you just solve Maxwell's equations with right boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are, are this, are your dielectric properties and conductivity of your tissue. So we solve this using a, a commercially available that we actually use several different software because these kind of models are quite large and uh, complicated. The accuracy uh, is, uh, it, 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 it cannot be guaranteed uh, all the time. So what we usually do is we use different software and to make sure that we get consistent results. And then we calculate, we can solve for the, the whole model. We can get the electric uh, uh, field distribution. Then we can calculate this something called SAR, or specific absorption rate, which is also important for, for all the cell phone uh, manufacturers that they, they need to uh, measure or and calculate the SAR that absorbed uh, by a tissue. It's uh, basically in uh, was a unit of a watts per uh, kilogram. And so we take this SAR, and this SAR is absorbed power, which would be the source of the acoustic uh, equations. So here's the stage two is the acoustic modeling which you can see SARS here is the source and we solve a couple differential equation which relates the P here is the pressure generated as the position and time and U here is the particle velocity. And in this case we have to solve the acoustic uh, um, differential equation using either a FDTD a finite difference time domain or a PSTD code. This we have to uh, develop uh, uh, in-house because uh, it, it doesn't really exist um, any commercial software to do that. So uh, here is an example of a slab-based uh, breast phantom. So we started this. We do a simple modeling. In this case, we have a breast model, which is not that realistic. It has a 10 centimeter uh, uh, width and a 10 millimeter uh, height and you can see in the middle we embed a target which is a tumor has the property of tumor and we have a waveguide antenna waveguide was filled with mineral oil so that uh, the size can be a little bit smaller and we can have higher power density and then we have to have a matching layer because the uh, the you there will be a large reflection at the between the breast and the uh, and the waveguide and so this way we guarantee maximal amount of power goes into your sample. And then uh, on top of this, uh, so if you look at the top field, we have the acoustic transducer. So basically we calculate the pressure as a function of time and position everywhere there. And then it's very interesting that uh, since we want to also look at the spectroscopy, so we, st we went from about 2 gigahertz to about 12 gigahertz. And uh, in this case, we studied the, uh, 
different tissue with, uh, with the same target. And the tissue, we num name them group one. That's the highest, so that's a tumor, and lowest is a fat. So it turns out that if we have a different targets, and you can see that the generated uh, uh, thermoacoustic signal or pressure is act actually has different slope for different tissues. So you can imagine that if we have spectroscopic information, we can, by looking at the slope, we may be able to tell what kind of uh, uh, tissue it is. And uh, for, from what, what we know, most of the uh, thermoacoustic uh, work before uh, only uh, considers a single frequency. So, so we have a lot of information in the spectroscopy. And uh, after we, uh, we demonstrated that we can do nice imaging, I, uh, I skipped a few slides, but, but we were able to, uh, to construct the image and see, uh, see the target uh, clearly. So we went to a more realistic breast model. So in this case, we have a 3D phantom. This is obtained uh, from MRI. By, uh, it's, a, it's available in the open literature. So you have the real breast, and uh, the breast model is the 0.5, half a millimeter uh, cubic voxel, and it has accurate broadband uh, dielectric constant and conductivity. So the color map, again, is the dielectric properties. So in this case, we still have the waveguide uh, as the microwave excitation, and we have the ultrasound transducer array surrounding the, the breast. And uh, um, we can, uh, I'll show some imaging later. But uh, it turns out that even the, uh, even the tumor tends to have higher, um, has a higher uh, uh, conductivity and loss. But compared to, uh, that's compared to, uh, to fat. So for example, we have the adipose and tumor here. You can see the contrast is, is very large. It can be as high as 10 to 1. But if we have the uh, tumor compared with glandular tissue, they are, they are actually fairly close. We have a low contrast of about 1.1 to 1. So, and typically tumor arises in the glandular tissue. So this has been a major problem for microwave imaging, and similarly it will be for, a, uh, for, for the uh, uh, thermoacoustic imaging. So in this case, what we have done is we studied a uh, uh, contrast agent. So the, the idea is if we can uh, use the uh, con contrast agent such as a, a particle here, uh, for example, there, there's a different contrast agents like uh, magnetic particles and etc. And if you, if we can coat them with a uh, with a nice coating that can attach a ligand, which will will uh, find the tumor and attach it, then therefore, uh, once the uh, contrast agent was injected and it will attach the tumor, and in this case, we can have higher contrast uh, between the tumor and the glandular tissue. And th this has been used for MRI and a number of other, uh, a number of other uh, imaging modalities. So um, from some of the research studied uh, in using different uh, uh, agents like nano, carbon nanotube, et cetera, uh, people were arguing you can have a contrast of two to six um, to one. So in, and uh, some of the popular contrast agent or, or some of those are, are being used, the others are, are really proposed, including micro bubbles, in which case it actually decreases the conductivity and dielectric constant. And then you would, it's basically a cold, you, you, you make your, you decrease the, the loss, and so you have a colder target. And then magnetic nanoparticles like uh, um, uh, uh, <coughs> iron oxides, and uh, uh, we also studied single one nanotubes and et cetera. So here in our model, we, uh, let's see, did I have the number? So we, we used a uh, carbon nanotube based in our model, which we assume we can increase the conductivity by about 60%. And then what we do is that we do a back projection imaging and with, for the uh, for the sample with contrast, and then we also have an image for the sample without a contrast. Then we take the difference between them, and that's a, we obtain something called a differential image. And the idea is hopefully we can see the clear indication of tumors. So the uh, uh, so we called this uh, uh, contrast agent enhanced the thermoacoustic imaging, 
And in this case, we studied four different type of a breast model. Uh, they are named class one to class four. This are a standard uh, a breast model that uh, the, the distinction between them are the density or basically the, the density of uh, glandular tissues. So you can see that for highest density of a glandular tissue, your, uh, the conductivity is the highest and uh, tumors are embedded in, in the model. And you can see, of course, if the, for class four, the, the most dense one, the, uh, the, the more difficult it is to, uh, to see the tumor. So the modeling details, um, and uh, so what, what we have here, so for example, we have pre the contrast agent, you can see there is some contrast, and after the contrast agent, uh, the contrast uh, becomes much bigger. The conductivity went from about two to a little bit over three. And uh, if we, so we do the simulation, we use microwave excitation, and then we measure the acoustic signal here, and then we reconstruct the image, and you can see uh, the post and pre. And you can, in each case, you can kind of see the tumor there, but it's not that clear. But if we do the differential image, and you can see clearly uh, the tumor shows up as, as uh, uh, what we uh, hoped it to be. And not only that it worked for the class one, the easiest case, it works for all, this, all four classes. And you can see the, the final differential image. Uh, one is the XY plane, the other is, uh, is the XZ plane. And you can see for each cases, we were able to uh, see the tumor clearly. And so it's an independent of breast density. And to be more quantitative, uh, we can also do a three-dimensional uh, image reconstruction. So the, for four cases are compared here, you can see there is some, the reconstructed 3D tumor and extra tumor are plotted, are compared here. And uh, uh, also, the, uh, we studied different tumors with uh, one, two, three, and four millimeter of, uh, of a diameter. In each case, we were able to uh, we were able to detect it, and uh, the resolution using the one microsecond square pulse is found to be uh, about 2.6 millimeter, which is uh, very good compared to the uh, microwave imaging. And uh, I just want to add something here. So, if we want to ever, uh, if we ever need to have a higher resolution, uh, the way to do it is to reduce the the pulse width. Basically, the pulse width of your uh, microwave excitation determines what kind of uh, uh, frequency content you will have in your ultrasound signal. The shorter the pulse, the higher the ultrasound frequency content. Therefore, you would have a higher resolution. But there is a, a trade-off you would have to consider, which is if we uh, reduce the pulse width, the deposited power is going to be smaller. Therefore, your total signal will be smaller. So you take a hit in signal to, uh, to noise ratio. And uh, so the next thing we have done is uh, uh, we want to apply some of the uh, compressive sensing techniques to, uh, to help us improve the performance. Uh, there, there are two things we can consider. One is the image I have shown you uh, in the previous page. Uh, each one of them, we actually had uh, about 1,300 uh, ultrasound uh, sampling points uh, throughout, you know, basically across the whole, uh, whole breast region. So either you would have to do a scan using one detector, and that would take quite a bit of time, or you can use the array. Uh, still, it will be, your system will be, uh, will be uh, more costly. So the idea is if we can uh, utilize some of the compressive sensing ideas that uh, utilize the signal sparseness, uh, then maybe we can reduce the needed measurements to still achieve reasonable detection or with the same amount of uh, uh, um, measurements, so same number of measurements, we would have better uh, resolution. We actually demonstrated both uh, in uh, in both the experiment and, and uh, um, in our model as well. So, the, uh, of course, for to use this compressive sensing technique, uh, we would need incoherent measurements 
And uh, we also need to use optimization method in order to reconstruct the signal because you're, uh, you, you are basically undersampling uh, your, your, your system. And uh, so here's the, uh, uh, we applied this technique for the exactly the same model for the uh, contrast agent enhanced thermoacoustic imaging. So as I mentioned, uh, traditionally we need very dense measurements. And uh, if, if, if we consider the SAR in the breast, it's actually uh, generally not sparse. Because if you, if you consider SAR of the whole breast, uh, there is SAR everywhere. Because uh, you're, even if it's not tumor, like you have a glandular tissue, even fat, you have some absorption. So if you only consider SAR, it's not sparse. However, since we're doing the differential imaging, the differential SAR of the tumor is actually spatially sparse because before and after contrast agent, uh, the only difference you have is going to be where the tumor is. So that, that's a, a, a classic sparse problem. <clears throat> so how do we implement this in our 3D model? First, we fix the transducer array, and we divide the imaging region into small uh, unit elements. So we could use our finite, uh, fin uh, use our finite difference time domain model to uh, to come up with the huge library, but that takes too much of time. So we developed an, an analytical method to solve those differential equations, which uh, uh, it uses some assumptions. For example, assuming uh, it's acoustically uh, homogeneous, um, uh, it turns out it works very well. And which saves us a lot of time uh, in the numerical simulation. As a comparison, if we do the, we do the full uh, wave numerical model for each position, we would uh, it would take a few hours, and then we would have to uh, you know uh, calculate a thousand times. And uh, but using analytical method, it, it's much much faster. And so, and then we would form a partial or sparse dictionary from the complete library. And then we would uh, uh, randomly put the transducers with reduced density. And then we use optimization method to do the uh, image construction based on this partial library. And so you can see this is our original, uh, this is our original setup. And uh, we had a, a 1,219 element sensor array. So all the previous results you've seen are based on, on this kind of uh, 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 dense sampling. And then with the it was the, the partial library we built, and in this case, we reduced this to about 100 element and in a random way. And uh, so that's a factor of 13 reduction. And you can see the reconstructed tumor is uh, almost uh, the same or very similar to, to the original case. And if we further reduce it to 50 elements, and you can see that it, it becomes a little bit worse. However, it still, uh, you can clearly see the tumor. So to be to quantify the uh, the results using different uh, um, number of uh, uh, scanning points, we define three figure for merit. Includes the center of the extra tumor, includes the the shape of the extra tumor, and includes the volume difference. And uh, and you can see that the figure of merit, uh, of course, uh, the the compare with the original one. If they're equal to one, then that means you. You, you uh, obtained the results uh, completely. And then we added three figure of mirrors together. That's the red cross here. You can see uh, this is the original dense scan. And if we reduce it to about a factor of 100, uh, the factor of 13, so now it's only 100 elements. And the results, the figure of mirrors are about the same. And if we go uh, lower, then it starts to degrade. So basically, at least we were able to um, increase the the uh, scanning speed by a factor of 13 without, uh, without degrading the, uh, the uh, um, performance. So now I want to move to the uh, experimental part of, uh, of the talk. So we have, uh, uh, since we, I s said previously, we want to, to investigate spectroscopy. So we actually have a, a capability to do from about 1.2 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz frequency sweep. And if you look at the pulse width, we can go from uh, anywhere a little bit smaller than 0.1 microseconds to, uh, to 10 microseconds. 
Uh, remember that uh, the shorter the pulse, the higher the, accurate, the higher the resolution. But the longer the pulse, you lose resolution, but you gain signal to noise ratio. So this is a typical setup. We have the power uh, amplifier or pulse generator, and it goes to a, you can see a waveguide antenna here, and there's a tank here. Your sample will be set on top of the waveguide, and the waveguide will, will uh, send the micro radiation, and then your you ha in the tank you have coupling liquid, and the transducer is on top. You can do the scanning, and you can set this up with the transducer on the side as well. So the first example uh, experiment we did is we just uh, take a simple sample. This is a a printed polymer, so that it's a. a Polymer has a, has a relatively low dielectric constant, which is about 2.7, with a, a kind of a low conductivity as well. And the, the feature we printed there is a, has a size of about 1.1 millimeter. So here's the setup. Antenna radiates to the sample, and we have a de used de deionized water here as the coupling liquid. And the transducer is here to do the scanning, and then uh, the input uh, microwave pulse shape looks like this, and with the and with the measured uh, uh, ultrasound waveform, we can reconstruct the image. So it's showing here is uh, uh, so we have the same sample, but we rotate the sample in two uh, in two uh, orientations to study the electric field polarization effect, and here. On the right hand side here is the simulated image. In this case, you can see we can reconstruct the, the, the uh, character UA here. And this is an exper experimental image. And you can see the, the comparison is pretty good. If you compare the original image and the experimental image and simulated image, the correlations are between um, 0.7 and 0.8. And also, we found out that the polarization effect has some uh, effect because you can see this one, uh, this the image on the uh, uh, on the lower row is a little bit worse. That's because the electric field is in y direction, and in this case, you have a very abrupt uh, uh, field change in the uh, on the sample, uh, which will will give you a worse performance. So, with our model, we can predict very similar things. So the um, this kind of indicates that the, the model is very useful uh, in terms of optimizing and understand your, um, the, your, your imaging uh, performance. So this is a, a 3D slice picture. The one is the post echo. The other one is the uh, thermoacoustic uh, um, image. So we can do 3D uh, image as well. So to further quantitatively verify our model, because the model is actually quite complicated, it would take quite a few hours to do the EM model. Then you take the EM model as the input of your acoustic model. It takes another few hours. And uh, uh, people always question the accuracy of a numerical model in a complicated system in the, uh, like this. And so what we have done is we measured Using the same sample there, we measured the absolute pressure, uh, which was calibrated by a hydrophone. And you can see that the experimentally measured um, uh, max uh, peak pressure across the sample uh, goes from about a 5 to 13 um, pascal. And the experimental prediction is, is very close to it. So this kind of uh, uh, agreement is, uh, is very, very encouraging. Um, and I, I believe it was the first time uh, for thermoacoustic modeling com comparison with the experiment uh, we actually have this kind of a quantitative uh, verification. So now, uh, the next thing I will talk about is using thermoacoustic imaging for potential explosive detection. So the motivation here is uh, IEDs are often embedded in high water content. It's actually a major uh, threat in uh, in uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, in Iraq and, and some of the uh, uh, the war zones, and it turns out there's a, there's often explosives embedded in the, in mud on the roadside, or actually even in dead animals, and uh, so so the idea is, um, how can you detect it at a standoff uh, <coughs> at a standoff uh, distance? 
So the conventional method is X-ray. But X-ray, we know, is ionizing radiation. It's not safe for, uh, uh, for the operators. So in this case, actually, if you think about thermoacoustic imaging, if you have high water content with explosives embedded, it actually has a very high contrast. Because water is similar as tissues, uh, has high dielectric constant, high loss. And most of the explosives, uh, explosives we would be worried about are like plastics, which has a very low dielectric constant and uh, almost zero loss. So this would be a negative detection. You would have a, uh, instead of a tumor case, you have a bright spot, you would have, actually have a cold spot uh, for, the, uh, for the IEDs. So the, the comparisons are showing here, two to three dielectric constant, zero conductivity, uh, for water, uh, it's much, much higher. So in principle, it's feasible to, to detect it. But the problem is, for traditional thermoacoustic imaging, you, we need this coupling liquid. And this coupling liquid is OK. You know, if you are if you're um, you're doing your, uh, your ultrasonic, uh, you know, the B mode uh, examination, uh, the doctor would, would put some gels on the, on, the surf, on your skin, which is OK. But if you are doing, uh, for some applications, like explosive detection, you want to be away from it. You don't really want to touch it. And may maybe you can imagine for some application like brain surgery, you don't really, you cannot afford to have a coupling liquid. And for burn diagnosis uh, or even live animal imaging, um, I've seen a nice picture of, uh, uh, of a mouse inside a water tank with, with the breathing uh, mechanism. It was, it was, but if you can do it without the coupling liquid, then uh, it's much better. So the idea is we need to have non-contact thermoacoustics. So instead of using a ultra, traditional ultrasound, uh, ultrasound uh, transducer, we're going we're proposed to use a vibrometer or basically an interferometer. So the idea is you have the antenna and you, you send a microwave to your sample. There's acoustic wave generated. We know that acoustic wave cannot propagate out if it's air because of the large impedance mismatch. Everything will be reflected back. However, if you consider the surface of your sample, they still will have very small vibrations, physical vibrations. And if you do some calculation, you'll find out they're going to be on the order of a picometer to nanometer. So the idea here is, can we develop a, uh, some kind of a vibrometer so that we measure the displacement on the sample? And since the displacement is actually proportional to the pressure wave magnitude, then we may be able to use the displacement to form the image. So our approach is we uh, had two approaches. One is using a W-band vibrometer. W-band is a millimeter wave frequency at 95 gigahertz with a wavelength of about 3 millimeter. The other one is actually a laser vibrometer exists. Um, uh, I guess a lot of you may, may, may know this better than me. So you can, you can buy a commercially available laser vibrometer that can measure the vibration on the surface on the order of uh, 20 picometer. So that, that's very accurate. And then, so <coughs> this is a, a picture of the W-band vibrometer. We, we collaborated with the Raytheon and NIST uh, they develop the very sensitive uh, low phase noise sources for, this, uh, for the vibrometer. So the idea is um, use this so that we can remotely detect the signals. And why do we have two approaches? You can see the sensitivity of the W band. Uh, this is the experimental results. It's about 0.2 nanometer. Uh, the 0.2 nanometer, that, that's already uh, a record value. Uh, considering the wavelengths of, uh, of uh, 95 gigahertz is 3 millimeters. So th this is very, very accurate. But it's still 10 times worse than the laser vibrometer. However, in this case, we need the signal to go through, for example, hair. If it's a dead animal, we want to, the signal to, to go through the hair, or go through clothes, and etc. And that's impossible for the laser vibrometer because, um, in fact, when we did measurement using the, the laser vibrometer on the sample, we, we usually have to put a piece of uh, shining silver tape so that we can have a nice uh, a reflection there. Um, so, so we tried both, and with the W-band vibrometer being the uh, potential 
uh, being, being the more practical way f uh, for, for real applications. And so this is the W-band uh, vibrometer block diagram. So we have a very low phase noise source and uh, it's split into to two parts. The, one of the parts goes to radiate it out to your sample and then whatever reflected back to the sample will be received and compared to your original signal and and uh, if you go through some mass, the, the basically the the phase difference between these two signals is going to be proportional to your uh, displacement. And uh, we have done complete noise analysis that uh, you know we think we can do even better than 0.2 nanometer, and uh, uh, with uh, better W-band sources. Uh, so I. There's, uh, we, we have a, quite a bit of a data on W-band vibrometer too, but um, some, we actually uh, brought the system to a to, uh, uh, transportation safety laboratory of uh, DHS in the Atlantic City, but um, most of those data has not been cleared. We, we cannot publish them yet. So I'll just show you the, the, uh, the idea and uh, some of our data using the optical vibrometer. So basically you have the, let's say you have an animal body with the, with the IED and your signal comes, your microwave comes in, there's a surface vibration generated and you interrogate this remotely with your vibrometer and then you can come back with the imaging. And uh, uh, what's to be noted that the rest of the, 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 the the IED actually have, have very low signal generated, so you have a cold target, and the rest of the animal body will give you a stronger signal. So this result is the laser uh, vibrometer results. So we use a uh, agros gel, and that simulates the animal tissue, or uh, basically it's 99% uh, of the water, and uh, you can't really see it here, but embedded in them, we have two targets, which are rexolite disks, and they have very similar uh, properties as some of the explosives like C4 and etc. Dielectric constant between two and three and almost no conductivity. And the microwave, this is at three gigahertz and four kilowatts, pulse width of four microseconds. And uh, um, we, the laser vibrometer was used to do the scanning. And you can see the measured time domain displacement. This is the raw data, and this is the frequency domain. You, you FFT it. And very interesting that uh, uh, there's the resonances because due to the thickness of the sample and et cetera. And there's actually, um, so this is the first, uh, this, this is the first, this is we filter the first uh, peak, and you can see that we see a cold target here. And it's very interesting that if uh, if we filter the second um, uh, second harmonics and uh, do the similar imaging, we actually see a hot, hot target. And there's a lot of a rich uh, information in there. This is because of the mismatch between your your explosives and your gels and all that. So uh, we're still in the process trying to extract as much information as possible from there. And as far as we know, this is the first non-contact thermoacoustic imaging uh, ever reported. Uh, people have done non-contact imaging using laser vibrometer for photoacoustic uh, uh, for photoacoustic signals. So uh, I still have a few minutes. Okay. So the last topic I will be uh, talking about is thermoacoustic communication. So this is a, a uh, kind of a side project we came out with uh, just by doing this. We we're doing the summer acoustic imaging for a long time. Then we thought, huh, um, it, it's interesting. Can, can we use this for underwater, from air to underwater communication? So how, how is underwater communication uh, done now? Um, so if you have something in the air, uh, you could use an EM wave, but it, it has to because the older microwave signal we know that has very high attenuation in, in water. So anything gigahertz or even megahertz would not pro propagate at all. You could do kilohertz or a few kilohertz, and those, of course, your antenna is going to be huge, and uh, you can, you can you're not going to have a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth. Your data rate will be low. Or another way is you can have your submarine to to kind of a surface and and a stick out an antenna, uh, so that you can use the the regular wireless communication. But that makes uh, the vehicle are very vulnerable, right? So the thought is, since if we have 
electromagnetic wave, we hit the surface of water, and there's going to be heat generated, and then there's going to be acoustic signal generated, and we know that um, underwater communication, if everything is underwater, people use, uh, use acoustic signal, right? Uh, there's a, a radar correspondence would be sonar. And uh, uh, so the, the thought is, if we modulate our EM wave, and then we generate a heat, and this heat is modulated by that information, then there's acoustic wave which may travel much longer uh, to, uh, to, to your um, submarine or uh, underwater vehicle. So it's kind of a, um, you know, we didn't know if it would work or not, so we, we did it in the laboratory, and you can see this is, this is quite a primitive setup. So we have the antenna here, uh, waveguide antenna here, we have a transducer uh, buried underneath uh, in the water, and then we uh, blasted the, the water surface uh, with a, a uh, modulated signal and see if we can we can get the information back. And uh, we only did a, a, a three letters TAC thermoacoustic communication. If you look at ASCII code, that's a, you know you have a, what, about 21 of them, and uh, uh, you have a few ones and a few zeros, and, and this is the data sequence. So we, we this is the data sequence we, we sent it out. And to be safe, we didn't try to be aggressive. We just used the bit interval of uh, one milliseconds, and. Uh, and you can see that it's interestingly enough, we're able to measure, this is the measured servoacoustic signal, we were able to measure all the ones and zeros nicely. And if you zoom in to the ones, and th this is the signal you will see. So uh, we were able to actually su successfully demonstrate a TAC. And uh, um, so we're, we're actually trying to work with, a, there's a, uh, there's a uh, underwater autonomous uh, vehicle uh, club at, at UA. We're trying to work with them so that we can implement uh, this kind of a setup in their uh, in their underwater vehicles to to see if we could do something more realistic um, than than just the laboratory in a in a water tank. And uh, we build a, again. We build a a comprehensive model of it, uh, including both the antennas, the microwave pulses, and etc., and the ultrasound uh, uh, transducer and we studied uh, some, per, uh, we, we sweeped some parameters just to understand more. And you can see that with higher water salinity going from 5 PPT to 35 PPT, we actually increase our signal. This is quite interesting. If you're trying to do a, a traditional wireless communication with the EM, with microwave, of course, the higher the salinity, the higher the loss, and then you're not going to go that far. But because we're generating heat. The more heat we have, the better it is. So we, uh, we would have higher signal if we have a high salinity. And uh, uh, so I think I'll, I'll conclude here. And uh, uh, thermoacoustic effect has promising applications in, in many areas, earlier breast cancer detection and explosive detection. So the breast cancer detection actually has quite a long history of about 15 or 15 or more years. And the explosive detection is actually, I think, uh, our group and a Stanford group were, were the, among the first of doing this uh, under a DARPA program. And uh, um, also, we've been working on a very new, and uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say this is mature. I, w I don't even know if one day this will be actually practical or not. Uh, there's still a few technical challenges we're trying very hard to address. But it's, it's a very interesting uh, idea that we know it works somewhat, at least. And we have developed a theoretical numerical modeling and image reconstruction uh, for, the, for the entire system, so we can really um, uh, explore the uh, system design parameters to optimize the, the performance, and we've done a compressive sensing technique trying to speed the, uh, to, to improve the performance uh, without increasing measurement uh, uh, time. And uh, we developed the non-contact explosive detection, that's also one of the first, and uh, the TEC here, of course. Um, the, so this is a uh, collaboration between my group and Professor uh, Ross Wheatie's group. Uh, this, this people in red are, are uh, postdoc or, or uh, uh, PhD students has already gone, and the, the, the rest are, are still with us uh, continuing on this work. I think uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh,
think uh, there are any questions from the audience.